welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here on our TBM Tuesday and have so many people joining in uh, for this lively discussion. My name is Todd Tucker, and I'm the VP of Standards and Education for the TBM Council. And it's my pleasure as well today in that I don't have to moderate the session. We're going to have a great discussion uh, led by Denise, who I'm going to introduce here in a moment. As per usual, uh, all lines are muted. And uh, if you have a question, please ask via either the chat or the Q&A interface, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom uh, uh, application here. So please do that. I'll monitor for those and help uh, make, make sure we address as many questions as we can that are coming from the audience. Um, and with that, uh, just no further ado, let me go ahead and quickly introduce our uh, panelists and, and moderator and just kind of a fireside uh, chat that we're having here. First up uh, is, is David Lundahl, who's the CIO for Children's Minnesota. Uh, welcome, Dave. And then secondly, we have Brad Newton, who's the VP of Technology Administration and Enterprise Applications for Wellstar. And then moderating and uh, certainly uh, you know, taking part in the discussion today is uh, Denise O'Hara-Webb. And Denise is the interim CIO for Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center, which is a mouthful, but she's also the former CIO of Marshfield Clinic. So with that, Denise, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Todd, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to just share a little bit uh, about my background um, and how I got exposed to TBM. I, I had joined Marshfield Clinic Health System back in 2016, and uh, they were on their TBM journey. That was my first introduction to technology business management, and, and I was a disciple of uh, Dean Meyer, if anybody remembers or knows who he is. Uh, he was the original proponent of running shared services organizations such as IT uh, within companies as a business within a business. So a lot of the same uh, principles and tenets of, of, uh, that I saw in TBM were similar to what Dean Meyer uh, had uh, advocated. And so, you know, we, I got involved with this TBM journey back in 2016, and uh, um, and I really saw the value of approaching IT as a business within the broader business, and how important technology was to enabling our um, our business and being a multiplier. And especially, you know, we've just had some unprecedented changes and challenges with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And, and it is really, uh, those of us who have been involved and are using the TBM practice and the Aptio tool suite uh, really had some advantages in terms of being able to pivot and be agile during this period of disruption. And so, you know, TBM has been a pretty important uh, important practice to me. I, I'm actually serving on the TBM Council's Executive Advisory Board, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about what TBM brings um, to all the industries and especially to healthcare. So uh, Dave Wendell and I go back a ways. Uh, he's been a CIO at several places, and uh, he's a Wisconsin fellow colleague. He and I were involved in establishing the Wisconsin Statewide Health Information Exchange. And uh, Brad, he and I met at a, at a TBM uh, board retreat, council board retreat, uh, an executive forum in Williamsburg, Virginia, and I uh, got to know each other. Uh, and so I learned a lot about what he was doing down in Atlanta at Wellstar. And in fact, at that time, Dave Wendell was their interim uh, CIO, right, Dave? <laughs> That is, that is right. It's, yeah. uh, that's in the small world category, Denise. Yeah, so this is kind of a small world. And uh, TBM has become very popular in our industry. And in fact, two of the TBM council board members are healthcare CIOs. And one of the council's most actively engaged work groups is the healthcare work group. And they've even built out an extension to the TBM taxonomy for healthcare. So systems like Ascension Health, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Kaiser Permanente, Tenant Healthcare, 
Christus Health System, Cleveland Clinic, and Intermountain Health, in addition to your healthcare organizations, all have active TBM programs. So why don't we just start with, you know, why is TBM so important to our industry? I, I can take that. You want me to take that, Brad? Maybe I'll start. And then you, you can improve on my answer, right? I think that would be better than me trying to improve on your answer because I wouldn't have anything to talk about. Um, so the, the reason I think about it, Denise, and I, and I like, I don't think you and I have ever talked about the Dean Meyer scenario and the shared services, but I, I, I worked a shared service organization for a while and that certainly grounded me in a lot of, a lot of things. But the, the way I, I think about it is that you know, we're a, in, in healthcare, we're, we're a low margin business, right? We, so we don't have a lot of margin for error. And, and I, I typically say, look, we, we really can't afford to make mistakes, especially on big things, right? Um, so when you're, when you're in a, you're having a good year when it's a 3%, you know, three and a half percent margin, that's, that's, that's not a lot of, lot of room. And so we have to get things right. Um, you know, I, I think then with, within that, <clears throat> just like every industry, the te technology that we need to be successful in what we do, um, it just that, that demand for that technology just keeps growing and growing. The, the uh, amount of, of use cases, the uh, new, new technology, legacy technology, it's just, it's just through the roof, right? But we, we're, we're low margin. We don't have a lot of, lot of room. And then you know, we know our biggest cost is staff. And, and from, a, from a staff standpoint, you know, it, we're, healthcare is about people taking care of people. And our, our biggest expense within that staff is nursing, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so as a CIO, you know, I never, all right, how are we gonna fund all of this technology? I know, let's reduce the number of nurses we have. That's like a, that's like a no, that's not anything that you ever wanna kind of get, it makes, it makes no sense. Um, and so what, what the universe we have to live within is the, is the technology budget. And so TBM is a way for us to, to work within the dollars that are given to us to steward every year uh, to find ways to be better stewards of it. And I think that's, that's critical because we need, to, we need to be there for the organization to deliver new technology and not always have our hands out asking for more and more money. And TBM is a way to do that. I think that's why it's so critical in this industry. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I 100% and I agree. I think that's very well said, Dave. I think we, I mean, we're also all nonprofits and we, not all healthcare is nonprofit, but those of us here today, we are nonprofit. So we provide a lot of charity care. So every dollar that's spent on something in IT is a dollar that's not spent on charity care. So our ability to explain what those dollars in IT is, are, are actually being used for is, is critical because there are a lot of people that um, look at IT, or at least this was the case in our place, you know, five, 10 years ago, is it's like a black box that just is, a, you know, you put money in and you're never really sure what you get out. You just keep putting more and more money in. So being able to explain the value that's coming out of that has been uh, r really important, especially as we're talking about, is it worth continuing that investment? Yeah, or or some call it. It's a giant black pit of that can never get filled up, Brad. That's what some people say. Bottomless black. <laughs> Bottom. Yeah, there just seems like there's no, um, uh, you know, before TVM, there was no real awareness of of the actual demand across the organization or the consumption by various business lines in the organization, and it. You know, raising the awareness and having transparency are are really critical aspects. You know, I think of TBM. Yes. Um, well, well, let's dig into that demand side of technology for a bit. You know, there are usually more demands on our IT budgets and our staff than we can obviously serve, and it's also tough, you know, to put the brakes on projects or other spending on our business areas. You know, say, hey, wait a minute you know, I, I've funded that, I'm supposed to get that, and they think their project is the most important project, and um, so how can, how can we use TVM effectively to deal with the demand side of IT? How, how about if I jump in first on this one? Um, earlier, earlier this year, we, I mean, I'm sure all of us experienced the same thing, a rapid request to slow down IT spending. Yes, and the example I'm going to share isn't about a project as much as an ongoing service. So for us, 
one of the quickest ways we could reduce spending was to look at our contractor population and scale back quickly. Most of the contractors that we had in the spring were working on our service desk. And it's very easy for the business to say, well, of course, we don't need as many people on the service desk. So having the conversation with them in a different framework, talking about the value that they get from the service desk and what it's going to mean from a business perspective, we were able to talk about our average, uh, our average hold times now, our average speed to answer is about 30 seconds. How high can that hold time be before the business feels like we need to spend more money? Is it okay if we go to a minute and a half? Can we go to two and a half minutes? Because that directly relates to how many people we can remove from, you know, from the roster, which ties to exactly how much money we can spend. That changed the conversation. And, and it was very fortunate because three months before that, they were screaming about hold times. We reduced the hold times. And then when the hold times went back up after we scaled back, at least they knew what to expect and they knew that they had been part of the decision because we've been transparent about the consequences or the value that was going to be scaled back as we scaled back the spending. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. <clears throat> I can, maybe I'll have a pre-COVID answer. Very good. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good one. So um, Denise, the, the way I, th I think about demand and, and I think about decision-making, right? And it's, you know, especially in a, in a health system, in the health system. And, and I've, I've had a chance to look, okay, how do, how do decisions get made? And, and more, <laughs> probably more often than not, more, definitely more often than should be, um, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple of doors that decisions come in. One, one is a squeaky wheel door, right? Yeah. So to just someone is really, really good at, at rattling things and making, making noise that, that what they need to do gets done. Okay, so that's, that's one door. There's, a, there's another door that comes in that, that also is, is, um, can, be, can be a problem is based on title, mm -hmm. right? So it, it doesn't mean that what's, what's in there is, is bad, either one of them, because people generally don't ask for things that are bad, they ask for good things. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that what's being, being asked for or planned, uh, ex except for what you know, the CIO asked for, that's always good, good stuff. Um, what was being asked for a plan is the best thing, right? Is it, is it thing, the thing most aligned to it? And, um, you know, even, <clears throat> so you've got operators out there and operators um, are sometimes in, in a health system, they're, they're downstream from big, big decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. But they're closer to what actually needs to get done. And, and so, I, you know, as, as I set things up, I, I try to, okay, how can we set things, these things up in a way that, the operators have a fair seat at the table for right. the technology things that, that need to get done. Um, Cause the, the C-suite always, it's an easy, it's an easy path to get those things done. And so from a, from a demand standpoint where, you know, I think TBM can, can fit in is wh where are we, where are we investing, right? Um, where are we investing now? Um, how is that aligned to, to the strategies that we're trying to accomplish for the organization? And you can, you can just kind of keep moving down the line of what, what's going to move the needle the most on the strategies that, that, that need to be accomplished. Most health systems strategies, you know, they're, they're usually in pillars and, you know, quality, financial, you know, et cetera. Often they line up to the quadruple aim now, um, you know, of, of, of patient experience, clinician experience, value, and, and quality um, usually line up to those. And so when you, we think about our technology projects, um, you know, we, we want the, especially the new stuff to align up as much as we can to supporting the best, the best parts of those. And I think TBM is a way to help us, is a way to help us, you know, do that in a fact-based, you know, way. I think Brad is a good, good example of using, using facts and data to, um, get to what may may have been a knee jerk reaction of just yeah just just reduce the number of people that are answering the the, the phone and so I think TBM allows fact based decision making so when you allow fact based decision making you can get to better decision making and where you're going to invest right and and you know and I would add to that that you know having a TBM framework and having the facts and the data really is the foundation for a governance. Uh, you know, a lot of times organizations try to deal with the 
the squeaky wheel or, or the, the position level type requests by having a governance um, uh, process and framework. But those don't actually end up being very effective if you don't have uh, the data and the facts to serve up to that governance committee. And I really think that TVM enables that uh, and facilitates that conversation to decide what is strategically aligned for the organization. Is this going to help uh, solve a problem, grow our revenue, uh, improve the patient experience, to be able to have all those conversations uh, and have them be fact-based, uh, have fact-based decision-making. Yeah, and it's not only kind of what, what we're going to do, but how much we're going to invest in. One of my, one of my CIO life, life lessons you know, learned was back when I was, I had that shared service organization under, under my um, leadership and you know every year in the budget process you know the CFOs of the the, um, the owner CFOs would always come with their multi-million dollar request to reduce the budget right mm -hmm. so I Dave that's that's good thank you but we need five million off you know this as a as an example that's usually what they would do um, but then using data and in, in, in typically around the projects that we're going to do the team had gotten really good at estimating what it's going to take to do a project. They knew where all of their time was being spent. And I, and I do think where our time is, is spent is one of the most important pieces of data that we could possibly have and where they're lined up to projects. And so it was like, okay, you know, CFOs, let's, let's uh, just kind of pull out your list and you start having a conversation about what they want you to cut. And then they, they quickly tell you to go away and they don't, you know, they leave your budget alone. Right, right, because they start to realize the benefit realization because, you know, sometimes it's not about cutting IT, it's about investing more in IT. And, you know, yeah, I, it's I, not that, right. they yeah. don't want to make a bad decision, but when you can point to here's where these dollars are going to yeah. the kind of the black box, you know, thing, then it's like, all right, I, you know, I get it. These, these are, we, we support and approve investing dollars in this way, our, right. our precious resource. Exactly. Well, well, let's explore this in another way. So um, let's talk more about, you know, a little more about using those facts and cost transparency that TBM provides to create new funding. Um, so for example, um, can we glean insights from TBM to justify automation that reduces manual work and frees up labor? I mean, around this whole topic that you're talking about, you know, where are people spending their time? Um, do we have, uh, doctors or nurses doing menial tasks, you know, here we have highly trained healthcare professionals. Um, can we identify areas that will actually uh, bring higher return for the organization? You know, a good example, think of all of us have probably done some sort of COVID screening at the front door. I mean, how much, how much resource is that taking and how can technology uh, facilitate um, uh, reducing the uh, cost consumption, resource consumption around that. So, uh, you know, so let's kind of talk about that angle about TVM helping us identify uh, not new money, but money that can be um, pushed in another direction. One of our um, one of our finance people did an analysis this summer and looked across our eleven hospitals at the cost we're spending on those screeners. And it was an eight figure number if we keep doing it for a year, which shocked wow. everybody. But um, what's a bigger concern at the time she did the analysis, what was an even bigger concern though, was that it was tying up those precious people. So with, with a COVID surge, it's, it's your clinicians, the people that are taking temperatures of people at the door, they really needed to be taking care of patients instead of screening staff. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we quickly mobilized and we're running a couple of pilots right now to combine a mobile app that will ask the questions and, and will change the questions as the CDC recommendations change or um, as our leadership wants to throw in other questions and combine that with, with an, a kiosk that takes the temperature of staff members as they walk through the door, put the data together and then do some automation of the routing to let the manager know, okay, Brad might be sick, he's going to employee health or going to urgent care instead of coming into work today. The, um, 
the magnitude of the savings is going to be huge. We don't have any money in the IT budget to buy these kiosks or to buy this app, but it is going to be a lot less than that eight figure number they threw out at us earlier to do this. So people haven't even asked what I think it's going to cost. They're, they're just throwing money at it. Cause that's it a big, big number. That's a big number. Um, I get, well, let's talk afterwards, Brad, about how we can invest in companies that are solving that problem. That might be our retirement. <laughs> So, yeah, my my one of, was you shouldn't use cardiologists to take temperatures. <laughs> That's the only way it could cost that much. Be, be Something I enjoy um, just because it's it's different, uh, Denise. I like I like talking to startups, you know, startup vendors. Um, there's just there there's there's an energy about them that's just enjoyable. That's different than your legacy vendor conversations, and you just nice to be around. But. One of the challenges for them is they're, they're always coming in the door with a really niche thing. Something that is, is really in my mind is something that was never discussed at a senior leadership table. I, I'm not aware that it's, that it's an issue, um, you know, but they've, they've identified here's a way to solve something in, in a health system. And, and, and there's a whole like, it's an avalanche of these, these things coming at you as a CIO in a year. Um, I think just putting, you know, two and two together, Brad, and what we were saying about the, the, the data around what screeners are costing, that, that might be one way, Denise, that TBM could be, could be relevant is, is finding, finding um, you know, not problems, but, but areas where there's inefficiency, waste, dollars being spent mm -hmm. done differently. And then, and then when these technology solutions that are out there you know, you have to somehow sort through them to find out wh who's who's actually worth talking to. Who, who can we? Because you, you know, from a demand side, we we can barely keep keep pace with our legacy, you know, right. legacy work, right? Let alone find find new solutions. So that might be one way to to you know someone really good with you know TBM to let's say let's let's point TBM at finding opportunities where developing or, or finding new technology technology solutions would make a ton of sense. Yeah. Hey, Todd, I, I, do we have any great questions from our... Uh, we do. Uh, yeah, I was going to interject as well, Denise. Thank you. Um, so Jamie's asking one that's very related to what you guys are talking about. And, and, and the question is, have you been able to, using TBM principles and or Aptio specifically, correlate IT-related services and capabilities directly to healthcare outcomes? For example, how investment in IT-based capabilities can improve metrics like readmits. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? I, I have not yet. Not directly. We're usually one or two steps away uh, from the direct outcomes. We, we might measure things that influence those direct outcomes, but we're usually a step or two away. You know, I think the 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 area that that would be, and and I think we're all still pretty early in this this TBM journey, right? And oh. and and finding, gosh, I know for me, even even finding practitioners to work on the team, I feel like I, I'd love to have more people that are that are pointed at it, um, but it, it takes time to time to do that. But you know, one of the areas I think that's it's about innovation, and let's talk about like physician physician satisfaction, right? Those are those are two areas that, again, as, as legacy, you know, upgrades, th those kinds of things just are just a, such a suck of, of all your resources. How do you how do you find time to do to do innovation? How do you find time to do projects that support physician, you know, physician satisfaction, physician, um, which is a huge, huge topic. I mean, we just it's one of the quadruple. It's one of the aims now, quadruple aim. I think a way to. Uh, really get at that just just off the top of my head would be to um, help you carve out space to do to do physician efficiency physician satisfaction type projects um, they're they're there um, but but they get they get consumed by demand in other ways and so anything you can use to carve out the ability to know these these resources are protected um, you know, you know, Brad, in our, our common experience in a, in a health system, the, the C, you know, you know, the CEO, it's important to her. It's very, very important to her. But we'll get what gets lost in the, okay, you know, we got strategies, and as they get pushed down, as, as people develop things, you know, it, it's it just kind of gets lost as a specific, you know, initiative. 
Um, but you know us, you know us there. So I think TBM can help you. You know, for instance, fire about time there. Innovation, digital is a huge is a huge topic now. Um, I think helping you carve out time to to work on specific things. Nurse, you know, nursing would be the same thing. I mean, there's there's ways to carve out time. And then it's just a matter of, of the, the made the last mile, which might be the hardest, Brad, in terms of proving, you know, the outcomes or directly tying the outcomes. You, the best may be just you go to sleep knowing you move the, you move the needle and, um, you know, it's going to take a while to convince the statisticians that you directly, <laughs> directly move the needle. You know, I think that when you think about um, the capability maturity model, um, you know, there, there is a capability maturity uh, ladder that you have to go through in TBM. And I think that's at the highest level of capability and maturity. And, and in fact, we got a question on the chat uh, from Nick Blackburn. He says, it sounds like TBM is helping all of us to have great conversations with the business. Um, how hard has it been to get this level of maturity, the maturity that we all presently have, which I think it varies between all of us. Um, I'm at the beginning with my current organization. And um, what's been, been our, uh, your biggest challenge along the way uh, in terms of you know, developing this maturity and creating this relationship with the business side? You know, what are the key ingredients? For me, the biggest challenge has been um, discipline and focus because we, you know, we did the rapid Aptio implementation and I think I saw Eric on the list of, of panel or participants. So Eric from Aptio helped us get started and it was like 10 weeks and we were up and running, maybe 12 weeks by the time we added on Vendor Insights. And we had a roadmap, but as we started learning all the things that we could do within Aptio, it's very easy to get distracted by all of the things that you can do and to lose focus on what it was you originally set out to do. So, um, about a year in, I went back and looked at the original roadmap that we had put together and realized, oh, well, we didn't do all that stuff. We've got a lot of really cool dashboards and, and scorecards and things that help us measure some things that were, that became important after we started. But um, like two and a half years in, we, we can talk about our app TCO, but the level of defensibility is, is not where it needs to be. So we're sort of, um, rebuilding some of the, the bottom parts of the model in order to get there. So long-winded answer, but put together a plan that says, here's our objectives, here's where we want to be, and make sure that you pay attention to that plan a lot more often than I did, and, and you'll, you'll reach your objectives faster. Red, you know, the, um, just, just thinking through, and, and by the way, just, just for me, um, my, my main job is finding someone like Brad, uh, to convince, convince them that it's a really good thing to do and then get out of, get out of your way. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. so we had that, we had that conversation a couple of years ago, Brad, I'm like, Hey, I, I just, I've got a topic. I wanted you to kind of, if you wouldn't mind digging into it a little bit. And then, and then that was really kind of, well, and that, I think you came and you're like, yeah, I think there's something here. Right. But yeah. then the, the first, the first hurdle is, is that what's the CFO going to do? There you go. That's, that's that the first hurdle. I was I was holding my breath on that. I'm like, geez, I hope this I hope this works. I don't know that I can, you know, there's no way I can argue money with with that guy. He's he's a he's an Uber Uber finance guy that I'll just I'll just you know, okay kind of go. But you know, he supported it, right? So that's like the first hurdle done. And if you can get your your CFO at least not to turn it down, right? They may not be a you know, be, be there telling the CEO, we got to do this, but at least they don't, you know, object to it. And then, and then it's a way to kind of stealthily, you know, kind of get it. So you can slowly increasing the influence over time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. He originally said, this sounds like a fancy cost accounting tool and we don't really need that, but I trust you guys, Dave, Brad, if you guys think this is the right thing, we'll give it a try. Yeah. I, I had a similar, similar experience at Marshfield Clinic. Uh, the CFO wasn't on board at first, and uh, uh, and I think if you talk to the current CIO Jerry Coaster, I I think he's fully on board now, and and relies on them using TBM and their Aptio tools to um, answer important questions, especially around you know they that particular health system has done a lot of M and A, 
And uh, I have to say having a TBM model uh, taxonomy, the tool suite is, is absolutely instrumental if you're gonna be involved in a lot of merger and acquisition. Um, you know, Denise, a, sto a story I, I typically tell just that I, that I now have the ability to tell since I've been in this, this business a long time. And so I, I remember the, my first systems analyst job at a hospital in, in 1995. And I, was, I, I walked in through the door with, with Nancy. We were the first two systems analysts ever, right, in an in a almost 400-bed hospital. Um, you know, so, so at that point, all you needed before was to keep the computers running in the data center, a couple people on, on desktops, one person on the help desk, and that's pretty much all you needed to run a hospital. Create, kind of crazy, right? Um, but, I, and I don't know what we were back then. We were, what were we, a half a percent of operating, uh, you know, three quarters of a, per, we, were, we were a small, small chunk of, of the hospital's annual, annual expense. And, and now, I mean, it's, when I look at benchmarking, I, I sometimes run across IT spend that's, you know, eight, 9% of operating. And um, so that, I think that's a data point, like, wow, that's, that's different, right? You're running a, you're running a business now. Um, one health system I worked in, I was, I remember being shocked to just kind of look, I was just looking at the financials one day and, and every hospital's, you know, ex expense was laid out. I'm like, holy, sh I, you know, if you put IT's budget there, we would be like the third highest budget hospital. I'm like, th this is crazy. I, this is a little scary, you know, to be, to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, like, so they, you start to really feel the target on your back. But, um, you know, IT's a, IT's a big spend now, right? And you can't just do projects and do support. You got you to gotta manage that spend. Right, right. Well, um, one of the folks on the uh, webinar, Sherry, will we'll dredge. Wildridge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to read, read on the screen here. Uh, so uh, how did you respond to this just sounds like a fancy cost accounting tool? I mean, I got a, a similar thing. It sounds like this is just duplicative of what we already have in accounting. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give my answer, but I'm here. I'm interested in hearing yours as well, Denise. Um, in, in our case, we spent a lot of time explaining to Jim, our CFO, that um, while there are some similarities, we've got a lot of costs in IT that might not be um, terribly variable in the short term. They are fungible in that you can move people, you can move resources, whether they are human resources or virtual computers and servers from one product to another. So making sure that we are adjusting in closer to real time by having people focus on what are we spending on storage? Why are we spending it on storage? That's that's the objective. So an annual cost accounting survey performed by KPMG isn't gonna get us the information we need for decision-making on a timely enough basis. So it was I'm not saying it's not a fancy cost accounting tool, but it's a decision-making tool for IT leadership to adjust our resources in accordance with what our customers need. And to run IT like a business. And to run I IT mean, like a business. I, you know, the way, we, the way we tackled it is we, we proved it out with data. So we, we built the model in Excel and um, what was happening, we weren't able to be very nimble or agile in answering the CFO's questions. And, and, and the finance team kept coming to us for information that they couldn't get out of their own systems. And, and so, you know, it's finally like, if, if you want us to be responsive, then we need some tools, not Excel. <laughs> So I, I, think, I think you just have to give it time and you just have to have some good use cases and you have to prove it out with data. So yeah, definitely. So let me ask, how does TBM and Aptio change the way um, you all plan now? I mean, what's, what's the benefit of this in terms of planning and forecasting? And um, does it make it easier for our teams or is there something more there for our businesses? I mean, what about all of that? So this was the first year that we used Aptio's IT planning module for our, uh, for our projects. Mm -hmm. And it was also the first, well, 2020 is the first for a lot of things. So um, 
this year for the first time, long before we went to the most senior executives to say, here's what we're recommending for the IT budget for next year, we were able to go to a layer or two below and say, here's the list of force ranked IT projects. And here's where the line is based on the, the capital plan that's in there for five years. And here's all of the stuff below the line that we're not gonna be able to do this year. And we were able to show to all of those stakeholders that yeah, your phone system that you really needed to get replaced this year, it's, it's below the line. So in order to move it above the line, here's all the people above the line, the stakeholders name is right next to each project. And it, um, it sparks some very interesting discussions. Now we've, we've done it in the past, but it, it was a lot faster and it was a lot more important to have that level of transparency this year, especially as money was tighter than it's ever been. Yes, indeed. I think Denise, for me, it, it means when I when I ask uh, my team a question, I get an answer a lot lot faster. And we've got a very good practitioner named Brad Sparish on the, on the team, and, and it, it, I think it really helps helps uh, helps him, and, and then helps therefore helps us. Um, I think the other thing, though, in addition to what what Brad said, you know, we we did like everyone else in the industry did, and we we, we canceled elective surgeries and did other things, went to virtual care. And, volumes are down the, 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 the dollars are down right mm -hmm. and so we've got a, we've got an impact and, and we're, we're making <clears throat> making changes with that um, just just the the TBM is part of a, a broader philosophy of stewardship you have to steward those those resources that you're, you're given mm -hmm. so one of the things that we've been successful with this year is, is driving out costs and TBM was was helpful, very helpful in that and identifying where we have costs to drive out. And so what what that's that's helping us do is that's helping us to blunt the the impact of, sh of short term. We got to make decisions because volumes are down and permanently down. We're able to blunt that because we have other dollars to contribute to to the gaps that are created due to COVID. Um, and, and I think that's a critical that's a critical item because um, you know, we also, we've, we've got short-term things, but we've got a transformation that we need to pull off and there's major pivots that are going to happen for our organization. And, and just like anything these days, all of those pivots require technology. They, they right. require technology support and stuff. So if, if I find myself um, too impacted, we find ourselves too impact, impacted on the, on the professional side, on the resource side, we're not going to be able to support all that. So by, by virtue of the fact that we're able to do stewardship, that's, that's blunting things some and, and um, uh, very, very helpful there. Yeah, you know, and I think from my experience, um, it really helped in terms of on the planning aspect. Uh, it gave a lot of visibility into what our assets were in terms of applications, the various contracts we had with different vendors and, and you know, with that visibility, you can really kind of identify uh, duplication across applications and do application rationalization, uh, contract rationalization. I think you know we had several Salesforce contracts. Um, it's like, why didn't we have one enterprise contract to try to negotiate a better price? Um, you know, and unless you have the data and the facts in that visibility, which TBM provides, you, you, really, you really can't effectively plan um, so that, that's one thing I've really appreciated about it. And, uh, I know our finance side has too, and, and any place we could drive out inefficiencies, drive out waste and redirect dollars to invest where it's needed. Like, like with COVID, uh, if, if technology wasn't out there to enable work from home and to enable virtual visits, uh, Never mind the impact that we were already having on the revenue, not being able to do inpatient surgeries and those kind of things. I mean, we, we had to kind of swoop in and make sure we could keep the workforce going uh, to even just run the business. Um, so it was, it was, it's really critical to have that insight. Hey, Denise, there's a, there's a couple of good questions here. One, you know, is, maybe more of kind of an accounting question, not a technical one, but Brad, this may be a, a good one for you, just given where you guys are at. But 
Al is asking, he's saying, look, RGL is complicated with intercompany transfers and account ID sprawl. He's, he's wondering, should we spend time on cleaning up the GL first, i.e. on the finance side, or can we get started with TBM in parallel? What, what are your thoughts there? My, so my response is absolutely get started in parallel because cleaning up the GL, if your organization is anything like ours, is a never ending task. And one of the yeah. things that makes it go a lot faster is being able to highlight in very clear graphical representations where there are things that do need to be cleaned up in the GL. <clears throat> so for, for example, one of, so this was um, one of my detours from the, from the roadmap that we had for TBM initially, but looking at spend by vendor over, you know, from month to month, me going back to the accounting team and showing that it was like, it was all over the place for maintenance items that should have been level every month helped yeah. shine a, a spotlight on some problems with the accrual and prepaid management on that team. So getting it, getting it cleaned up, you know, they knew that they had issues, but it was only when I showed them, this is the magnitude of the issue. And this is how it makes it very difficult for me to manage my vendors. And, and for me to explain, you know, why I'm over budget or under budget in a given month, it made it a lot easier to have those conversations, to be able to show them what we were doing uh, on the TBM side. So I'd say don't yeah. wait until the GL is cleaned. Brad, would yeah. um, would you say too that one of the things I think about that is <clears throat> the ability to to drive accountability to to the dollars, and so thinking about you know like if you've got data quality data, <clears throat> you're trying to have a conversation with the physician and they can pick out something that's wrong with that data, and then so then okay you you can't have your conversation about quality anymore because that's done. I think about the the dollars we have in our budget and it's not where we're going to cut costs is not always going to come from you or me it's going to be from all the leadership right, right. and you know as a for instance our you know at, at, at children's we had the gl set up in a way that like all of the costs were just like thrown into one one cost center rather than people's costs mm -hmm. so i couldn't have a conversation with any of the directors about how, how are you doing on your budget Right, because they don't, they don't, they have no idea because it's all just thrown into a big, big bucket. Um, so we fixed the GL that they get, you know, and it's it's going to probably take a year before it's like really kind of locked locked in <clears throat> where they actually know their budget. But to start this year, we just we just picked a number and we said since we had this, um, let's let's find two million dollars to save in our budget, and <clears throat> we proportionally allocated that out across all the directors, and then. And then for me, it's like every every staff meeting. Okay, Jim, <clears throat> you know you've got you've got this goal here. Here's your piece. How are you doing on it with your team? And uh, you know, and it's not a hard it's not a hard thing. It's just a that that Hawthorne effect. If you're looking at it, so something something will happen. Um, and 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 that's I think that's an important item. But if it's a if it's a mess and you don't have it lined up, it's tough to. Hey, are you having conversations? Because you know all that they'll everyone will spend all of their time doing support and, and projects unless you create some kind of kind of focus on one of your projects is saving dollars. How do you, you know, how do you do that? And so I, I remember the, all of the cleanup that you had to do, um, you know, if, how do you, how do you, for then me, how do I have an accountability? Like, Hey, what are you doing on budget? And if, if it's all, we don't know, you can't do that. So I think it's helpful in that way too. Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer back for Will might be, it depends. You can <laughs> probably get started in parallel, but if, if it's so difficult to tell what's going on that you need to make some core fundamental changes, like splitting one cost center into three or four, maybe that is worth doing first. But yeah. I, I would say, don't wait to get started if you don't have to. So, so Dave, during our prep call, um, you know, this brings me to this question, um, you know, around this, this topic, you said chargeback is like a dream for you, a dream of yours. And, you know, and that's not something um, you often hear from CIOs. You, you probably hear that from me too, because um, of my past experience. So I know some systems use chargeback, but not all. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, uh, you know, when I was initially with Marshfield, we did charge back. We had a bill of IT because they had put all of their IT in this wholly owned subsidiary company. So 
So we got very granular and had our own control over our GL and everything. But then once the company was dissolved in the, and the IT became part of shared services under the corporate uh, structure, it became more these bigger buckets that the money just got all thrown into and, and wasn't divvied out by line of business. So, you know, what do you think uh, chargeback provides that makes it so appealing I mean, to you, Dave? So Denise, why I, why I think that's that's a dream. Um, so I've, I've had the opportunity to, to onboard into a couple of different health systems over the last few years. And um, two, two conversations on the same topic. One, let's say you're visiting with a, a leader out there, an operational leader out there in the health system. And, and the, what you typically get or what you often get is um, you know, comments about lack of communication, questions about, hey, I have this project approved and I don't, I don't know, what's, you know what's going on with it, kind of a little bit to the black hole, black box you know, kind of a thing, right? And then, you, and then you have your conversations with your team, right? Especially if you get down to the, the staff and the manager supervisor level and you, gotta, you get a very quick sense of, we're just trying to keep up. How can you help us you know, keep up you know, kind of a thing? There's too much being asked of us. And um, it's, it's, it's clear in a non chargeback mode, um, all right, I'm, I'm already getting my allocation. Let's say you're running a hospital or a medical group. I'm already getting my allocation to IT. Nothing changes throughout the year. Whether I call IT um, 10,000 times to ask them to do something or I call them once, I'm getting the same allocation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's free to call IT and ask IT to do things, right? right. Which is, that's, that's not a demand management you know, tool. Um, so I think about just, uh, all right, if you're, if there is a chargeback, there's at least, and then you can, you can show that there's at least a, here's what I'm consuming. And so I have the ability to, to adjust my consumption and then adjust my corporate overhead, you know, that, that's, right. that's being me. So I think that it's helpful in that, but then, then too, when I th think about sorting out what you're actually, what work you're actually going to do. So if you, let's say. Usually the hospitals, the, the, the member hospitals have a, they have a, they have a leader of finance. They have leaders of the different areas. If they can say, all right, it's, it's, it's going to cost this. They can, they can, they can do what they do to say, you remember I talked about the operators earlier. There's a return on this, right? It's going to cost me $75,000 in IT resources, but this is what I can get done with it. You know, almost like business plan, like this, you know, does this make sense? And then, and then you go, right? So I think there's a better, there's better decision making that can occur with it, right? I'm, this is all theory. <laughs> it's well, well, if, you think, if you think about it, if, if there wasn't the IT organization and you had to buy it from outside, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 would, you would have to be accountable for what you're spending as, as a business line or what you're buying from the outside uh, commercial vendor. Right. So, you know, so I don't think that's, that's a far off approach. <laughs> Brad, you, you said you're not doing chargeback either. You, you said uh, right now you're doing something called showback light. What does that look like? And where are you headed with that? So it's, it's a, it builds on a lot of the things that Dave was, was talking about, or it's, it's, um, it's about, Giving, giving our customers the ability to influence the cost of IT for the organization. So all of our costs are allocated on a model that's created by some, some of the financial folks, but I can show them how one hospital A, hospital B, and hospital C are consuming certain things that are really easy to measure. So what we've done so far is any end user attributable costs so your Office 365 license, a laptop that's assigned to a person, or department-specific costs. So computers are assigned to departments frequently instead of to individuals. We can map that out to the different hospitals, and we can show the cost per end user. And in fact, um, I showed them a mock-up dashboard of total costs per hospital, the hospital CFOs, about a year ago. And they immediately started asking for chargeback, which shocked me. I was stuck. <laughs> And, and when I asked why, their answer was because we know how to get those costs down and we want the savings to show up on in our bucket, not yours. It's like, okay, well, that's the right behavior. That's exactly what I was trying to accomplish. And another, so it, they're also competitive with each other. It's a friendly rivalry. So if you can show 
the total cost per user at hospital A is double what it is at hospital B, that in and of itself will drive some serious behavioral changes. And those behavioral changes reduce the cost for the entire health system. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Todd, any other questions so far that have come in? Uh, yeah, there, there are some good ones. I mean, James has asked a couple of questions kind of getting at what you guys were just talking about around the conversation that you guys have with your, your business partners. But some of it is, he's, he's got two in here, but I'll kind of summarize as this is, how do you use the information from TBM to have the right conversations with those who are paying the bill? And Brad, you were kind of going there with, with what you just described, but any additional thoughts on how you make those conversations productive and create that accountability or that uh, sort of buy-in based on the data? So one of the things, so we've got um, their business relationship managers, we're calling them customer relations executives today. And we put them through this TBM foundational training class. Todd came to Wellstar and trained our team and we brought in some other people in the community to get the training. We wanted to make sure that the people from IT who are sitting in the meetings with the executives at all the hospitals know the language and know how to have those discussions about value and cost and that when I start showing them dashboards in Aptio, that they actually know what I'm talking about too. So I think it's um, it's important to have a TBM team, but it's, al it's also important to make sure that that team is not the only part of IT that knows the language and knows, knows the story and knows how to communicate the value. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I would actually add to Brad's um, uh, answer by saying, you know, just like you need a basic level of maturity and competency in every person in your organization around project management, mm -hmm. around data management, you need the same thing around, you know, TBM. There, there's got to be a basic level of competency and understanding um, because otherwise, we have all these tools and these capabilities, but you might be speaking to an audience that doesn't even know what you're talking about <laughs> without some basic competency. I agree. It happens to me all the time, Denise. <laughs> what did they just say? <laughs> oh my goodness. Hey, hey Denise, I, uh, I'm being mindful of the time. I think we have time for one more you know, good question. Uh, do you have one you want to ask or I could pull one from the, the, the list either way? Well, how about if I ask this last question um, of, of Dave and of Brad? So what is the lesson you've learned along the way in implementing and using TBM that you wish you had known at the outside, outset of your TBM journey that you would like to share with our webinar participants? You go first, Brad. So <laughs> I've already explained about the whole discipline and focus on your on your plan. So let me let me pick a different one, and I'll and I'll get kind of technical on this one. Um, the cost of storage is hard to measure for everybody. It's not just us. So if I had gone gone in knowing, you know, you see you hear presentations from Azure. Adrian, and, and how much data you get and how rich it is to see which of your applications is consuming rich resources. In fact, the data is overwhelming. You need special tools to manage it. In our on-prem data center, we don't have those tools. And it is so murky as to which resources are being consumed by which services that we deliver. We had to make a lot of assumptions up front and it was um, a little bit disheartening in the beginning. But as I've talked to others, I've realized this is not just a Wellstar challenge. This is a challenge that lots and lots and lots of organizations have. So um, the lesson at the beginning is understand that no matter where you're starting from, everybody else starts in a rough place too. The best thing to do is just get started. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great answer, Brad. I'm a, Denise, that's my answer too. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I can, I can add to this because, you know, one, one lesson I think um, I and my former team learned uh, along the way is 
how important it is to stay in step with the corporate, you know, the CFO and the um, uh, the corporate finance team, and to make sure that you're all on the same pay, uh, page, rowing together in the same direction. Um, you know, I, I'll never forget the day we had uh, Aptio come in to give a presentation and, and, um, and they presented to the CFO. And the, instead of starting with the basics, they kind of got into some of their fancier capabilities. Uh, and that right away conflicted with uh, the CFO's view of the world. And then they lost his attention immediately. And we had to recover from that. <laughs> so, you know, you gotta be in lockstep. You gotta know what your CFO is thinking. You gotta be talking to the finance team. You gotta be doing this together. It's an important lesson learned, you know, because ultimately uh, the CFO usually leads the capital committee and approves capital investments and those kind of things. I mean, he has a committee, but he's got a lot of influence or she does. So, um, you know, that's, that was an important lesson learned for us. Excellent. Well, we have about three minutes left. Um, Denise, Brad, Dave, I want to say thank you again. This was great, by the way. I uh, haven't been in this, this sort of role with these before, but the time just flew by. So I think that speaks very well of uh, the conversation that you guys led. It was terrific. Um, so thank you very much. I think we'd love to do more on this topic. One thing, um, just as it pertains to healthcare, Denise mentioned this. We have a work group uh, focused on healthcare, both the providers and the payers. So we have both sides covered. I know many of you come from systems that do both. So uh, you, you've got that covered. A um, little bit of involvement from uh, pharma and device companies, but it's mostly provider and payer. But we'd love to have you involved if you're not already involved in that. Uh, we will have a meeting that's open to anybody in the community at the conference the week of November 16th, which is the week after the, the main week of the conference, but we have one on the calendar. I can't tell you when that is. I should have pulled that up, but if you register and so forth, you'll see that in the, the agenda. Um, that said, uh, please join us for the conference. We hope to uh, have uh, you know everybody that's on the phone here or on Zoom here Join us uh, the week of November 9th. Um, we've got a great lineup of just some amazing uh, speakers, uh, content, both at the technical, you know, Aptio product level, but also at the executive level and everywhere in between. We have diversity and inclusion on the agenda, uh, which is, you know, an ever important topic for, uh, for our executives and our membership. So, Please join us for all that. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. We're very excited about it. And I think with that, again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you uh, on the next TBM Tuesday uh, after, after the conference. All right. Thanks, well, thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for facilitating, Denise. Oh. Thank you. Oh,